We are the Body Image Eating Disorders Treatment and Recovery Service, which is shortened to better because it's a really big mouthful and we didn't pick it as clinicians. Um, good morning. I'm here to talk to you a bit about our experience so far. Um, and I really appreciate what Beth was saying about we are very much a work in progress. We've tried some things out, given some things a go and got some learnings to share with you. But there's really not one right way, and we were just saying before how interesting it is that all the different specialist services have kind of developed in different ways around their family work and their services generally. So just here to share with you a little bit about ours. So for those of you, oh, overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about our service, our work with families, what we've tried, what we've learned, and what we're trying to do now. And for those of you who don't know very much about our service, we are a partnership between the mental health programs of St Vincent's and Austin Health. So we have a site in Kew, which is our community-based sort of um, centre, uh, and we are really an outpatient service for people with body image and eating disorders. We do have some inpatient beds, and our beds are in the Austin Hospital. We take referrals from a whole range of people. We cover the north and east of Victoria, right up to the borders of Victoria, so quite a way. Um, and we were first of all set up in October 2010, initially as a pilot, but now um, we have ongoing funding, which is good. We're quite a small team. There was initially five of us, at full-time equivalent, and now there's a little bit more. But yeah, resource-wise, as we all are, I think, we're pretty tight. So our model of care was set up to trial community treatment as really an alternative to inpatient treatment. So one of the differences in our services is that our day patient program doesn't have a lower BMI cutoff. So we're working with people who might have a BMI of 13 or 14 upwards, trying to help them to restore weight in the community, which kind of puts a bit of a different spin on the family role as well. So we provide an assessment and treatment planning service and a range of treatment options, support for GPs and primary care, working quite closely with area mental health services at times, trying to work in partnership. The service was set up as a research project, so we have a lot of evaluation activities happening. And we've seen about 300 people so far. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is kind of how our model of care looks. So the first point of call is our intake system. From that point, people are usually directed to the assessment and treatment planning clinic, and that's about three or four sessions, in which we aim to include family where we can. Occasionally, people might go straight into the inpatient unit if they are medically at risk, and that kind of is the only option. But if we can, um, we try and see them in the community first. But then after that, we've got our day patient program, which is a three-day week program. Um, CBTE, as, you know, as we're just talking about, and some family interventions. So, as we started off from the beginning, the commitment to working with families was really embedded into our service model because a range of reasons really we have a participant and carer group that sits behind the service development so they've been very involved from the from the onset we kind of know it's widely regarded as best practice where we can to include families some of the information that claire was talking about before like all mental health services we're accredited against the national standards and that's very important families obviously are a key part of that Again, as I said before, our model of care indicates that because we're working with very unwell people, it seems to make sense from a risk management point of view that families need to be included. And we kind of know that we need to, so all the clinicians know it, and it's a really hard thing, and obviously the, the evidence base isn't massive for adults with eating disorders, but we know that it helps. And we also have a mentor program as part of our service where we have recovered consumers coming through and talking about their experiences and who are able to say, you know, when my family started to get involved a bit more, it really helped. And that really helped us engage families now and the consumers that we've got now to actually agree to families being involved. Also, Claire mentioned before the Worldwide Charter for Action on Eating Disorders. So that families do have a right to be seen as a resource and valued partner, to be involved in the assessment and treatment planning. So as standard, we will be asking people to include their families in the assessment process. And again, for us, about informing them of the risks associated with their loved ones' eating disorders and what they should do about it if they notice that. In terms of sort of who it is, we're really asking people, is there a someone? It doesn't have to be necessarily your mum or whoever. Is there a somebody in your life, a partner, a significant other that we can engage with to help support you? Because realistically, 
recovering from an eating disorder is really, really hard to do on your own. So we're trying to actually find, is there somebody there who can support you with this that we can talk to? And also it's obviously really important from us from a clinical perspective to get some collateral and a, and a wider perspective on things too. So at the beginning, what did we try? So we created some flyers that on arrival, parents and families or whoever the, was there were given information about the services that we offer. If they weren't there, we gave it to the consumer to hopefully give to them. We incorporated the families very much if we could as part of our assessment clinic. So the goals setting process that we use, there's a space in there for what the family's goals are. We like to, if we can, if the person's willing to share the formulation. So part of the clinic looks at why might you have got this problem now? And what might be keeping it going? And so if, if the person's willing, that's part of what we'll be sharing with families to help just kind of raise their understanding and awareness of things. Um, we ran a family and carers education and support group that was a six session um, group, which was well attended. We've done some meal support sessions, primarily for people on the day patient program. We've facilitated building hope alongside EDV, and we've offered some time limited family therapy sessions. So, did it work? Well, we had a range of evaluations, so certainly our service is continually evaluated through um, satisfaction questionnaires and that sort of thing. That's okay. Um, we had some very positive feedback about the faces group. This is a kind of um, typical sort of comment, really, that actually the being in that room with people and, and sharing that experience was really valuable. But we also had some families write on questionnaires um, this. I didn't know that they offered any family support, which was a bit of a kick in the teeth, really. So, um, and we also knew as a team that we weren't getting the uptake that we thought. The people coming through the door, we weren't seeing as many families that we would have kind of expected to. Um, some of the other challenges that we noticed as well as a team around in terms of engaging with families, obviously in an adult service, so we're seeing 18s and up. Um, we, do we need their consent unless the risk issues indicate otherwise? Some of the carers and families were burnt out by the eating disorder and were saying, you know what, we don't want to come in and we're over it. They need to sort themselves out kind of stuff. We've also seen some families um, who are burnt out by therapy and obviously FBT has got a really good evidence base, but we're often seeing people who've tried that and it hasn't helped, and they're coming into an adult service, and so the families are kind of going, yep, yeah, we've done that, and it was whatever, we're not doing it again. We're a business as service, so we are limited in terms of what we can provide out of hours, although we have run the Building Hope Group out of hours, but even so, it's been hard to get um, yeah, the numbers that we would have expected. And we also noted that although the groups that we've run were helpful, it was really quite challenging because people were bringing up all sorts of stuff that you couldn't really address in a group setting and obviously confidentiality wise in a group setting like that we couldn't really um, kind of get to the bottom of things and give the individual, individual sort of feedback that we needed to do. So we thought well, what, are we, what can we do to find out what families want and then we thought well maybe we could actually ask them. So we sent out a survey in towards the end of last year and basically sent a survey out to all um, carers, significant others that have been noted down on intake um, about what they were wanting for and what they had and we came up with some ideas. So they were asking for education about eating disorders and treatment approaches, sessions around meal times, support to develop communication skills and managing their reactions to the illness, so kind of akin to the skills based sort of stuff information about support groups, and sessions focusing on looking at the broader difficulties that there might be in the family relationships. So, we had a bit of a think and we came up with this as our model that we're currently running with. So as you can see at the top is our single session family consultation. This is really the first point of access. So, in the assessment clinic, if clinicians are working with the person, their family might be joining in with that. If they can kind of see that there's a bit more here and it would be a bit more useful to actually explore things, they might suggest that the person in the family would benefit from a single session family consultation. I'll talk a little bit more about that and how that sort of developed and what the kind of theories that we're using for that. After that, it may be that nothing more is needed or it may be that we decide to link the families in with things. So the next line down, of things that we offer at Betters. 
so the systemic family therapy up to six sessions, meal support training particularly around um, for the day patient participants particularly, skills-based training we've offered in conjunction with EDV and hope to do that again. At the moment, because we're not, some of that stuff gets linked into the six sessions that we offer. And then at times we're also referring people out if we're recognising that this is a family who need longer term family therapy, we might be linking them in with private practitioners or the Bouvry Centre. And also we realised that although we were running a support group and it was going along reasonably well, Eden Disorders Victoria are doing that fantastically and let's use their resources and what they've got to offer. So we're now referring people into their community support groups as well rather than running our own. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our single session approach. I've popped the Bouvry Centre's little logo on here because this kind of stuff comes really from our work um, with them and learnings from them and the mental health team. People may be familiar that they've um, recently started to look at the um, consumer-centred family engagement model, which is drawn upon research that was done in the States about the fact that it takes on average 2.4 sessions to get a mental health consumer to agree to participate in a family session. And the kind of ethos behind this sort of work is really around being a bit more curious and exploring with the person about why is it that you don't want your family involved, rather than just kind of going, oh, okay, and not really exploring it anymore. Trying to find a way to collaborate and find, is there a way that they perhaps could be involved where it's appropriate, that, that we would feel comfortable with? There are certain things that we might not need to cover, but could we cover that, or could we look at this? So we know that intention to engagement is, is really, really crucial and perhaps something that we weren't really paying enough attention to before, I think. Um, so this approach actually is about yeah, exploring barriers not only with the consumer but also with the family too. In terms of the structure for the single session, again, this is adopted from what the Bouvry Centre are offering. It's really about joining with the family and really being over that, you know what, we've got this one session today, what would you like to get out of it? Um, I often kind of say to teenagers and stuff, right, you've trekked all the way in here. If this isn't going to be a complete waste of time, what do you want to go home with? And they kind of go, oh, well, I just want to start eating. Or they kind of come out with something, but we can actually create a bit of agenda together, very clearly saying, this isn't about my agenda and what I think we should be talking about. I really want to hear from everybody here about what you would like to get out of this. But part of the single session ethos is about really being overt Right, we're halfway through now. Are we on track? Are we talking about the right kind of things? Are we covering what you want to cover? Of course, often part of it is about providing support and education, thinking about what are the needs, and if they're not addressed in this session, where can we link you into to do that? And that might be through some of our services that we offer, or it might be through external supports. Sometimes, as we know with single sessions, that one can be enough. The process of actually families coming in and just talking through what's happening and having that space even having the appointment organised, we know that change can happen between that time of making the appointment and actually coming in, can be enough. And some, some families feel that that's, that's adequate. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the family therapy sessions that we offer, the six sessions that we do. Um, the reason that it's six sessions is, is primarily resource-based, so we're not obviously a service with unfortunately, um, and limited resources where we can continually um, to see families indefinitely. So we're careful about which families that we offer and creating goals that are going to be achievable in six sessions. And for those who need more than that, we are linking people out. When I was trying to put this together, it's really hard to kind of um, capture what we're doing in those sorts of sessions in kind of five or ten minutes. So this is sort of a very brief kind of overview, really. And I thought perhaps one way of looking at it would be to think about what are some of the goals that people come into for therapy with. So I've put some of these on this slide now. So to be mother and daughter again. So I think it was touched upon before about eating disorders have a good way of changing relationships and families. And we often see people who may be enmeshed or their structure of their family has become very reversed. Um, this particular case was around a mum and a daughter who similarly to what you were talking about really, we're talking for each other, we're unable to sort of take a step back and let each other go with their own kind of lives and health concerns. Typically for families, working out what's reasonable for me to be taking on in the family and what I need to give back. So that came from um, a young lady who was quite parentified in the family system and who had kind of taken on the parenting role and part of her <coughs> disorder was functioning to help her manage the stress and, and, and what was happening for her in that way. 
I want to be able to talk about more than the football. So we know that often communication in families is difficult when, for people um, where an eating disorder is residing and this was a case where in terms of talking about emotions and feelings and things like that at home it just wasn't happening. So actually trying to work and build on those relationships became part of the work. Finding the balance for families between watching over the person and stepping back. We talked before about they're adults now, it's a time to leave them be, but I can see that they're not going well. How can we do that? So actually having everybody in the room together to talk about that, making a plan collaboratively and together, rather than the staff saying to the team, staff saying to the family, do this. We're trying to actually work with the person there as well, because we all know that when families and the person try and work things out over the meal table about what to do, it's just not a good thing to try and help this time to be different. So a lot of families that we're seeing have been through really quite a traumatic process with their loved one, of being very unwell in that hospital, really wanting to make something to change this time around. Okay. So the approach in terms that we're using with the sessions, there's myself and another um, therapist who's training family therapy, and we're both using a range of, of approaches, really. But I guess some kind of ideas on here. I talked before about setting up clear expectations, what are we looking for out of these sessions? Broadening the lens from seeing the individual as the problem to the person in their context. Um, often we're involving the transgenerational sort of history, looking at the family genogram, exploring patterns. We do family sculpting just to try and bring things to life a bit to help people see about patterns of relationships that are happening and to talk about how things are now, how they'd like them to be. It's very much about respecting the expertise of the family, so we're very much saying we may have some expertise in eating disorders, but you're the expert in your family, and we're here really as a person to support you to find the solutions and hopefully to find some ways of making some changes which will help you to get towards your goals. This is a quote from Virginia Satir, so knowing something begins a change, experiencing it makes it happen. Remember, you learn to swim better when you get in the water which really just sort of signifies we try and do some quite practical role play sort of stuff in the sessions that we're doing to help bring change to life, which is horrendous for the families often. They hate it. But actually they come back and go, you know, that actually really helped. Because it's okay as saying, you need to go home and try and talk about this and try and do that and have you thought about this. But without actually bringing it to life, we find that often what happens at home perhaps doesn't really um, fit with what we were suggesting. Just a note as an aside about the families of our day patients. We decided from the start really that with regard to family input, we want families to opt out, <coughs> not in. So particularly if people are living with families and coming to the day patient program, we've really tried to make it non-negotiable that we're going to give your family some information about eating disorders, our treatment approach and the day program. That's not talking about the consumer necessarily and giving out information, etc. but it's just about keeping them in the loop really about our treatment approach to the foods, medicine, about meal plans. So we often have sessions with our dietitian or a clinician with families just explaining, this is what your loved one is doing, what we're hoping for, this is how it works. We also ask all the day patients to have some kind of family assessment. So they may decide not to include their family in that, but we would sit with them one-to-one -one and actually do um, some exploration of their family relationships. And sometimes people might have six sessions of one-to-one -one work, more sort of individual family coaching sort of work around some issues in their family that might be contributing to their formulation and making things difficult for them that the identifiers would like to change. Evaluation. Our evaluation is a work in progress, like uh, probably a lot of other people's. It's a really hard thing to evaluate, is my experience. Um, so what we're doing... <coughs> Single sessions, according to the model, we're following that up with a phone call a couple of weeks later. So checking in with how things have gone and then looking at what the next steps need to be. We're also looking at the Scott Miller tool as a way of evaluating the process of sessions. So are we talking about the right kind of things? Are we on track here? How did you find the session today in terms of actually engaging families? There's a range of tools that actually look at behavioural scales and we've got a couple of those. Um, the accommodation and enabling scale, the Janet Treasure one that looks at how families may have um, unwillingly adapted their behaviours to accommodate the person's eating disorder. So that measures a before and after um, outcome. And we, as standard practice, um, distribute satisfaction questionnaires to families and consumers at different points in their journey across the service. 
So that's about me. This is my um, contact details. I don't have the PowerPoints to hand out to you because I'm not that organised, but if anybody would like them, then feel free to email me or call me and I'm happy to talk further or if I can help in any way. Thank you.